Let's go live back to uh, Etobicoke at a pharmacy where the Premier is now speaking. Let's listen in. Uh, CEO of On Pharma. Over the past several years, as we look on Ontario's world-leading vaccine rollout, pharmacies have been amazing partners. We're so grateful for all the work they do. Keeping people and communities safe and healthy, and it's so convenient to be able to come into a pharmacy and uh, get help. And you couldn't ask for better uh, system, better pharmacists than what we have here in Ontario. The past several years also taught us when it comes to your health, the health of all Ontarians, the status quo is no longer acceptable. We need to be bold, we need to be innovative, we need to be creative. We need to look to other provinces and countries to see what they're doing differently and borrow the best ideas. I always say some of the best ideas in business or even in government come from other jurisdictions as well. We also need to be clear, Ontarians will always access the health care they need with their OHIP card, never their credit card. Our goal is simple. Whether it's an emergency in the middle of the night, a problem that's been bothering you for years, or tough decisions about a loved one, like when, it, when uh, to look for a long-term care home for one of your loved ones, no matter where you live, we want to connect you to more convenient care closer to home. Together, we've come so far since 2018, over, see, these are pretty staggering numbers, just think, since 2018, over 60,000 new nurses and nearly 8,000 new doctors have registered to work in Ontario. In fact, last year was a record-breaking year for new nurses in Ontario, with over 12,000 new nurses registered and ready to work. And we have another 30,000 nurses studying at a college or university, providing a pipeline of talent and reinforcements. We've also added 3,500 hospital beds, with another 3,000 more under construction. We're helping 30,000 more seniors find a long-term care home, with another 30,000 seniors being able to live in upgraded modern rooms. But when it comes to your health, we must do more, and we're doing more. When I think about connecting people to convenient care, I can't think of any profession better able to help than our highly trained, highly qualified pharmacists. That's why Ontarians can now go to their local trusted pharmacy for treatment and a prescription for 13 common ailments. There's no extra cost. All you need to do is show up with your health card. This new service is on top of pharmacists being able to renew prescriptions for most medications, including blood pressure, diabetes, and asthma medications, just to name a few. These are game changers for people and families across Ontario. Saving you a trip to the doc's office or to the emergency room. So whether you need antibiotics or medication for your child, you can now go directly to a pharmacy just like this one here in Etobicoke. Pharmacists always provide such exceptional customer service. And it's about convenience too. You don't have to worry about is their office open, is it closed? They're open, and uh, they're here, and a lot of them are open till midnight, and, and they'll always be here to service you. And I know it'll be no different when they help you with these common health issues, because giving pharmacists the ability to prescribe medications, it's making it easier, faster, and more convenient for people to connect to care, especially in rural and remote, uh, remote parts of the province. It will also help ease pressures on doctor's offices and hospitals, helping, helping to shorten wait times for more complex health needs. It's a real win-win for everyone. Friends, it's about you. It's about your health. Thank you, and may God bless the people of Ontario. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to the floor for questions. If reporters could line up behind the mic, uh, it'll be one question and one follow-up. And if you could please identify yourselves by name and outlet. First question. 
Hi, I'm Andrian Williams with the CBC French. Um, so the City of Toronto budget tabled yesterday assumes full reimbursement of billions of dollars of expected impacts from the pandemic, inflation, etc. Uh, Mayor Tory said again that Ontario promised to keep them whole, but he's struggling yeah. to understand what that really means. Uh, what guarantees can you give him? Well, we have an incredible relationship, myself and, and Mayor Tory. We work collaboratively together and, and really uh, talk quite often. I'll just give you an example. Throughout the pandemic, I believe the number was about $2.8 billion they received. And uh, we just topped them up on the transit of well over $300 million. You know, when it had the budget shortfall, who did they come to? They came to the province again. So we're splitting that one-third uh, with, with the province, one-third with the city, and one-third with the feds. But the feds, I don't know if they're coming to the table or not. They, they said they weren't. So... Uh, that's going to be up to the mayor to uh, talk to him. But our, our goal is to, to build more homes. We're, we're going to see an increase of close to 300,000 people coming into Ontario. And guess where they land? They land always in the GTA in Toronto. And we're in desperate need of uh, more people to fill the, the jobs, that, uh, the environment that we created. We're short about 385,000 uh, people to fill the jobs in the different sectors across the board. So we're going to work with uh, Mayor Tory. We always come up with a solution together, and uh, I look forward to having a great 2023 with them. Um, Follow-up question. Are yep. you uh, considering, on, on the subject of inflation, are you considering any relief measures uh, this year for Ontarians, uh, like we've seen in Alberta, for instance, with their inflation relief payments? Well, we've really uh, put money back into people's pockets, no matter if it's getting rid of the tolls and the east side of the, the city uh, up in the Durham region or, or getting rid of the license plate sticker uh, fees, putting money back into people's pockets, reducing the gas tax by 10 cents a litre, and that affects everything. That's what causes inflation, probably 30, 40 percent. The reason the inflation goes up is because everything is delivered uh, by a truck or a car or a van or a plane or a train. So we're going to continue uh, finding ways to put money back into people's pockets. Uh, inflation, we're, we're hoping to see, at least talking to the financial experts, it's, it's going to level off in probably May, June to 3% uh, percent roughly. And uh, we'll continue making sure we, we have an economy that's thriving and prospering. That's the key uh, area, is if you have a strong economy, you're creating great paying jobs, uh, companies and people, they pay up to the provincial coffers. That allows us to reinvest into the $150 billion of infrastructure, building 50 new hospitals or additions to hospitals, um, that, that's incredible. Forty billion dollars there. Building new schools. Matter of fact, we're building new schools right here in Etobicoke, and uh, making sure that we have the proper infrastructure. Building the Bri Bradford Bypass, Highway 413, highways across the the province. That's what we need to do, and we'll see more revenues up to the provincial coffers. Hey, good afternoon, Premier. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, and we're going to have a good one this year, aren't we, Colin? <laughs> Certainly are. Thank you. Um, when did you personally find out that Bill 120, Bill 124, was having a negative impact on the province's ability to actually retain healthcare staff? When did you find that out? Well, well, first of all, uh, no one has the exact number. But what I will tell you, uh, we've seen a record amount of healthcare workers hired in the province or, or going through. We had 12,000. The uh, College of Nurses were, were saying, but I want to do better than 12,000. Uh, we've hired, what, 60,000 new nurses. So we're going to continue making sure that uh, we, we hire more people. As for Bill 124, uh, as, as you know, you know, the hospitals negotiate with the nurses. Uh, Bill 124 is gone. It's, it's not going to be part of the negotiations. So we're going to continue hiring thousands and thousands of new health care workers, uh, nurses. We're building uh, medical universities to hire more docs. And as, uh, as the baby boomers uh, start getting older and need more health care, uh, we have to meet their demands. And, and that's the reason we're, we're pouring unprecedented amount of money into health care. But it's not about the money. Uh, and I, you know, I hear that from the CEOs and docs. It's about changing the system and delivering uh, better health care. And this is one small part of making sure it's more convenient for people to pick up uh, prescriptions and other areas.
Okay, but Bill 124 is not gone, though, because your government is actively fighting to reinstate Bill 124. Oh. We've spoken to, we, sorry, we've spoken to nurses, we've spoken to educators, I even spoke to people who worked at the Pickering Nuclear Power Plant. All of them say Bill 124 has left them demoralized. Premier, well, was Bill 124 worth it to you to save a few bucks? Yeah, well, you know something, what we look at uh, moving forward, it has, it has lapsed with Bill 124. Let me be very clear to the folks out there. You can hear whatever it is, Bill 124 has lapsed. Mm -hmm. Uh, you saw it with the negotiations with QP. There's one example. You're going to see the negotiations uh, when hospitals, uh, you know, hire new nurses. That has lapsed. So Bill 124 has lapsed. But I always have to be a prudent fiscal manager with the taxpayers' money. We just can't be out there spending willy-nilly and, and uh, as people are working their backs off. They're taxed to the brink right now. They can't just keep dishing it out, dishing it out. So we get, we have to take everything into consideration. But uh, it is lapsed, and, and uh, the nurses, uh, I want to thank them. Uh, they deserve every penny they, they, uh, they get. Uh, Premier, before Christmas, you and the other premiers um, asked for a meeting with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, did a first minister meeting, to discuss health care funding. What's the status of that meeting? You guys had said early January. It's now early January. Well, you know, we're we're still trying to get a get a date. Uh, I don't I don't know what's so hard about it. I, I actually went. And I called every single premier in the last week uh, to talk to him about different issues, and uh, we're we're going to keep uh, knocking on the door until until the uh, prime minister is able to sit down with us. And we have a lot of different uh, items to talk to. We want to work collaboratively again with the federal government as we, we have in the past to stir the economy. But also, let's talk about one of the most critical areas, uh, the Canadian health transfers. That is absolutely critical. Even large uh, province like Ontario, we can't continue uh, going at the rate without the support of the federal government. But I'm confident we will sit down and uh, with uh, the chair, Heather, uh, Premier Heather Stephenson, uh, she's doing a great job. We will uh, go through her lead. She's the chair of the Premiers this year. Now, Premier, the federal government said that uh, there will be new funding. They've indicated yep. that. But mm -hmm. they, that there will be some strings attached, including uh, uh, tying, tied to outcomes, tied to data collection. Can you live with those strings, uh, given that a, there, a lot of them sound like things that you have been talking about, your government's yeah. been talking about, can't you, is it, is it fair to say that you could live with those strings? Sure. Th th first of all, thanks so much for the question. Yes, you know, everyone has to be accountable. I always say there's one taxpayer, no matter if it's municipal, federal, or provincial, uh, there's one person that's paying the taxes, and uh, there always has to be accountability. So that's that's the least of our issues. Uh, do we want a little bit of flexibility? Um, yeah, and I think they're they're willing to do that because sometimes you, you need to shift funds as long as it's transparent and people can see it and, and uh, the feds can see it in the province. Um, we're we're going to get there. I'm, I'm really confident we're going to get there. Hi, Premier. Mike Crawley from CBC. Hi, Mike. Um, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, you were talking about uh, taxes earlier, and one of the things that your government is doing now is collecting tax, uh, carbon tax from big industrial emitters, so things like steel mills. Yeah. Um, uh, the government told me, the ministry told me, that you're going to collect about $2.2 billion over yes, the course of the next roughly, eight years. Yeah. What are you going to do with the money? Well, we have to reinvest it in, into protecting our climate, supporting our economy. And it's not, uh, you know, either or. When it, when it comes to the environment, I actually got a list off our team. And I sat back and I thought, my goodness, if there's one thing our government, I'm sure there's a few things, but one thing that we may not be communicating, everyone knows the economy, everyone knows the jobs we're creating. But what we can do better is communicate the successes that we have with the environment is staggering. It can't be uh, either or, it, can, it has to be and. So we can be environmentally friendly and create jobs. Uh, you look at the uh, electric vehicles, over $16 billion of investment. I think it's even gone up since then. But $16 billion of investment, tens of thousands of new jobs. 
switching over, which I'll be over at the FASCO, switching uh, the FASCO and Algoma into electric arc furnaces. It's like taking two million cars off the road, uh, exploring the uh, critical minerals up north to have the flow of goods coming down into the battery plants in Windsor and, and building batteries, uh, building a $30 billion transit system to bring more people out of their cars and, and put them into a great modern state-of-the-art transit program. Another area was the over $10 billion of green bonds that we issued that's never been done before. And I sat back and I, I told our team, I said, man, I'll put, I'll put this record up against anyone. Um, and that's, I just named a few. Uh, what we need to do better, we need to communicate that uh, a little better and we're, we're going to, but we can't do it alone. Um, another question, Premier. Uh, you talked about how the status quo in healthcare is not an option. Yes. Uh, I've had people from the government or close to the government tell sure. me that they're expecting you to make some moves for greater private sector involvement in the delivery of publicly funded healthcare. What kind of stuff are you looking at doing? Well, I, I, again, I, I don't even like the word private because it's, it's really not. You're, you're never, I can assure you, I'm looking into the camera. No Ontario will ever have to pay with a credit card. They will pay with their OHIP card. But if we can take the burden and the backlog off the hospitals and have independent health centers uh, with the same standards, the same actual docs uh, being able to go in there on their spare time, I'll never forget, I talked to a surgeon, and, uh, and I've talked to many surgeons, and he said, Doug, um, you know, my problem is I don't have operating room time. And he said his boss told him, well, just go out golfing instead of, you know, finding another avenue, another operating room. And he says, I, I want to help people. I also want to earn more income. And what better place is to have a high standards? And when we talk to people out there, uh, people don't care where they have to go as long as it has the same regulations same top-notch doctors that are working in the hospital that may have some hours to go into another area in a different uh, facility and operating and knock off simple stuff, not complicated, knee replacements, hip replacements, cataracts. These are no-brainers that are backlogging the healthcare system. We have, uh, what, I think 13 facilities now in Ontario that no one talks about, you know. I think one of the most famous ones is Shouldice. They've been around forever. There's another one that does cataracts downtown somewhere. But we need to have uh, facilities like that to take the burden off the uh, hospitals there. Hi, Premier. Hi. Shauna, City News. Hi, Shauna. Uh, just, I want to go back to Bill 124 for sure. a moment, just knowing all this time that the bill had a negative impact on the retention of nurses and that it contributed to the, you know, staffing crisis we're in today. Why are you pushing ahead to appeal the court's ruling that this bill is unconstitutional? Well, Shauna, I'm going to totally disagree with you respectfully. Um, there is no numbers, but I'll tell you the numbers. If it had anything negative, uh, that must be not accurate because never in the history of this province has there been more nurses hired, over 12,000, and that's not my numbers, that's from the College of Nurses, uh, over 60,000 new nurses uh, have been hired uh, since 2018. Uh, we've hiring more doctors than ever before. We're building more medical uh, universities than ever before. We're building more hospitals than ever before. Uh, but again, uh, Bill 124, uh, when the nurses uh, negotiate and the, and the hospitals negotiate with them, uh, Bill 124 doesn't exist. Okay, just this information was written in the transitional binder, but I do have a question next. Sure. Uh, this one's from my colleague, Richard Southern. Yes. Um, he has a question about the LCBO, saying we recently reported that the LCBO is now delivering in, uh, on Uber Eats. Some local restaurants are calling foul as they are required to sell food when delivering alcohol, whereas the LCBO is not. Do you think this is a level playing field? Well, I'd have to look into that because that's the first I've heard, but uh, LCBO, I think, had a, a really good... Like, Year, last year, they, they brought in over $2 billion of revenues to the taxpayers, which is good. But I'll, I promise you one thing, I'll look into that and find out what's going on uh, over at the LCBO. But I'll tell you, they're, they're an incredible organization, very well run, and uh, I'm proud to have them as an agency of the, of the people of Ontario. Hi, Premier. Siobhan Hi. Morris, CTV Hi, News. Siobhan. 
Uh, I'm looking for an explanation about why the government is appealing the certification of a class action lawsuit from families uh, of people who died in long-term care in the early days of the pandemic. We've seen tons of experts say that the government was too slow. And so why are, why are you pushing back against that kind of evidence? Well, because I think we disagree, everyone. It wasn't just the government. I, I think everyone saw, and I think it was CBC that said we're ranked number two in the world next to Japan. You know, everyone pitched in, every business, every person, every healthcare worker. Uh, we gave it our all, 1,000%. And uh, sure, did we have some challenges? Um, sure we did, like the whole world did. Uh, but did we perform extremely well throughout the pandemic? Uh, not we. When I say we, I'm not talking myself. I'm talking all of Ontario. We were phenomenal. If you want to do comparisons across the world, I want to thank the people and the healthcare workers and the businesses, the pharmacists, uh, shoppers and other pharmacies. They did an incredible job delivering vaccines. And uh, there's always uh, some good that comes from any crisis. And we, we saw when, when, you know, times were tough and challenges, you see where there's cracks in the ship when a pande pandemic happens, not just on, on health care, on procurement, on everything. And, you're, you know, it gives you an opportunity to, to fix it. But, I, I, again, I just want to thank the, the people uh, who helped out. I call it Team Ontario. Did a great job. Are there not any mistakes in those early days, specifically about long-term care that you're willing to admit to? Yeah, I, I, you, you know, some, I've always said, I've come out, I admit, if there's challenges, and yeah, sure there was challenges. There was challenges all across the world, uh, and it's how, how you react to the challenges, and everyone really pulled together. Uh, one, one story I know I've told before, you know, when it was those N95 masks, we, every, everyone, the whole world caught, out, got, caught off guard, and I called out at one of the press conferences for help uh, to all the industries. And within a month or two months, first of all, within two days, we had 26,000 people respond to the portal. And within two months, we stood up a whole industry. So we're never, ever going to be reliant on anyone in the world, on uh, PPE. <coughs> Sorry. So that, that's, uh, we're going to continue working with uh, everyone in Ontario. Hey, Premier. Liam Casey Hi. with the Canadian Press. Hi. Um, You've been talking a little about taxes this morning and how, you know, people are paying too many taxes coming out of their they pockets. Are. Yeah. You know, but many municipalities around the province, including Toronto, are now looking to raise property taxes during budget season. You've come up strongly against tax increases in the past, uh, but at this time, do, do municipalities have any choice but to raise taxes? Yeah, drive efficiencies. When I went down after David Miller with Rob, the spending was out of control. I'm not comparing because I'm a big fan of meritories. I'm just using my example. Uh, the first year, they said it couldn't be done. We found uh, over three and a half, roughly about three and a half years, uh, close to a billion dollars. And I always joke around, uh, you know, I think the Toronto Star said, no, no, it wasn't a billion, it'll be 700 million you only saved. Okay, I'll take the 700 million. But the point is, we, did, we delivered a 0% tax increase the first year. Government as a whole, municipally, provincially, federally, they don't have an income problem, they have a spending problem. If every government ran it uh, like in a business, um, you know, <laughs> it'd be so further off. If, if, if everyone, you know, ran it the way Jeff runs Shoppers Drug Mart, we'd drive things more efficiently. Uh, you know, I always say there's two speeds in, in, you know, doing things. There's government speed and private sector speed. My goal as a premier to make sure the government is running at private sector speed. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank question you. for uh, Mr. Jones. Hi, Minister. Uh, Dr. Moore said in September a long COVID strategy was coming in the near future, uh, but we haven't heard anything since. Uh, we've got a recent study that says 1.4 million Canadians uh, currently suffering from long COVID. And the defunct science table warned that long COVID will put more and more pressures on the healthcare system going forward. Just wondering when that strategy is coming out and what will uh, what will it entail? So there is a lot of excellent work happening um, in academia re related to studying and assessing the impacts of long COVID. Uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, the reference that you made with uh, Dr. Moore is 
how we as a ministry and a government can assist what is already occurring in academia. But I want to assure you that there is work ongoing today with uh, tests and, um, and patients who have long COVID to make sure that whatever they need in terms of assistance moving forward will be there for them. Thank you. This will be the last question. Hi, Premier Dustin Hi. Cook with the Globe and Mail. Hi. Ontario is facing a cold medication shortage right now for adults and kids. What is the government doing to address that? Is it looking to follow something like Alberta did by looking outside the country to secure supply? All options are on the table, but uh, the two best people to talk to are right behind me. I'll start with uh, the Minister of Health and maybe Jeff, you can uh, tell the people what Shops or Shoppers is uh, doing to uh, help us out as well. Thank you. Um, certainly when it came to the pediatric pain medication, there was a lot of concern as we saw uh, increases in RSV and making sure that um, p individuals and families had access to those medications. Uh, it is in conversations that I've had with uh, Minister Duclos and others in the federal government uh, that um, has stabilized now. Um, obviously, we will continue to make sure that as those supplies are needed, they are here in Ontario and available. I've had some conversations about what uh, Alberta has done just to see whether if in fact we do see a shortage coming down uh, again that we have options. But right now, uh, the, uh, the incoming supply has stabilized uh, as the federal government has been able to procure more. And Jeff, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Maybe the only thing to add is uh, if there's, uh, you know, gaps in, in terms of availability in the pharmacy, it's always important to consult the pharmacists. In some cases, pharmacies have been holding it behind the counter to kind of meter it out, make sure that people have active symptoms uh, when they're looking for the medication. Um, and, and then they can also actually help provide other solutions for the symptoms because uh, these medications don't cure, right? They, they help to manage symptoms. And Premier, back yes. to Bill 124. Sure. Uh, you say that the bill has lapsed, but if your appeal is successful, about 30% of the public sector will still be subject to it for a three-year term. So why are you fighting to reinstate it? Well, again, I'm going to say what I said before, no matter if it's health care or you saw with QP, um, you know, they're going to renegotiate with the nurses. It's going to be lapse, and, and we're just going to continue on making sure that we treat any government employee very fairly. And that's what we've always done. I respect the, the great job that everyone does. But in saying that, I have to be a prudent fiscal manager for the taxpayers. Um, folks, I'm, we're just going to wrap up here. And I want to I thank uh, the folks from the media for some really great questions. And over 2023, they're going to keep uh, holding my feet to the fire, which is a good thing. But I can tell you, 2023 is going to be better than 2022. Man, we, we went through a lot of challenges. Just think where we were a year ago, you know, about locking down and this and that. But with everyone pulling together, um, you know, we, we did fairly well. There's still a tremendous amount of work to be done in a lot of ministries, specifically health as well. We're going to do that. But we are so blessed. We're so blessed to live in the greatest jurisdiction in the world. I always say Ontario is uh, like the United Nations, and it, it's great. We have so many people coming in from around the world. You know, they know how great it is here. They call their relatives, friends, and families uh, back in the countries that they've come from, and I encourage them all to come here because we need the people. But again, we live in the greatest jur jurisdiction anywhere in the world. I'm going to continue working day in and day out to make it better every single day. And I just want to thank the people of Ontario uh, for, for having our, our backs throughout the pandemic and moving forward. Uh, God bless each and every one of you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. We've been listening to Premier Doug Ford alongside Health Minister Sylvia Jones. Uh, they were at a pharmacy in Etobicoke discussing a program to allow pharmacists to prescribe drugs for common conditions, but also taking uh, many questions from reporters on a variety of issues.